Hey there, fellow classic comic collectors. As always, I'm Scott Harris King, and today I'm excited to bring to you the Classic Comics Forum podcast. We are doing a three part deep dive into Mark Evanier's 1980s run on Blackhawk with artist Dan Spiegel. I'm joined by the esteemed Prince Hal to talk in detail about this run. So, uh, this is was recorded as a podcast, so there's no video. It's going to be audio only, but we had a lot of fun um, recording this. Uh, it's a, and this is the series that got me into comics, so I uh, hope you enjoy, and uh, let's just dive right in. In this first part of our three-part discussion, Prince Hal and I will take a look at the history of Blackhawk from their creation through their acquisition of DC, their many cancellations and reboots, and what led to the 1980s revival with Mark Evanier and Dan Spiegel. But first, as always, I'll be talking to Prince Hal about his experiences as a comic book collector and reader, and what it was like reading the original Blackhawk series in the 1960s as it was being published by DC. So without further ado, here's Prince Hal, and I hope you enjoy the conversation. I'm really interested to hear your answers to these, by the way, because sure. like uh, I'm because I'm ancient. I wasn't quite going to put it that way, but but <laughs> no. you're part of a group of people on the boards that I consider to be like the elder statesmen. I know, no, I know just what you mean because. Uh... There are many times where I feel I, as if my whole knowledge of comics ended about, uh, well, maybe like the mid '80s. <laughs> you know, from then on, it's like, oh, really? That happened, <laughs> and and I either can't remember it or I'm just not aware of it. So, I get it. Don't yeah. feel don't feel funny about it. Well, that's not a bad thing. I I started as we're going to discuss in detail later. I didn't start reading comics until 1984, um, mm-hmm. and having read you know comics since then. And a lot of stuff before then. My interest in comics pretty much ends in the mid '80s. So, oh, yeah, yeah. Well, no, that old saw about uh, the golden age of anything is twelve, and so you know you tend to look back on. It's almost as if you say, "Well, it was all so much better then." You know, whether it was sports or whether it was comics or movies or whatever it might be, and you just have these fond memories of quite often when you first became involved in something like this. I guess. Yeah, for me, it's interesting because my favorite era is actually the 70s um, mm-hmm. before I started reading. But when I was just a couple of years into collecting, uh, I'm talking all about myself now instead of even letting you talk, right. answer the questions. But when I've been reading for maybe a year and a half or two years tops, a guy that my dad worked with gave me his comic collection. He had about a thousand issues from the oh. early to mid 70s. Nice. So at a very sort of formative period for comics, it was like... You know, um, this was like 86, so Mm -hmm. Dark Knight was coming out and Crisis was coming out and all this stuff. And I was reading like issues of Richard Dragon from like 1974. (laughs) And you felt you were going back into the primeval mists. I I just loved that stuff. Um, Sure. The DC genre books from the 70s are what I really, really latched on to. Uh-huh. Well, I think uh, it's funny you said that about the decade before you started to read were interesting to you. I wish I could I could go back, let's say, to the the fifties. And and just as you were saying, there were a whole lot of genre DC comics in the seventies. And they just had, you know, for lots of reasons, all these bizarre different genres. And I and I found myself over the years really uh, liking those kinds of, of books quite a bit, whether it be detective books or um, westerns or, you know, the weird thing like I wish I had a complete set of Rex the Wonder Dog. <laughs> I think I've maybe read two or three of them, but they're just so interesting compared to the same old, same old. That's all. So what was the first comic that you ever read? I think the first comic I ever read was Star Spangled War Stories 105, mm. which which came out just um, at the end of August in 1962. And I was, what, eight years old. I was fascinated with dinosaurs like most other kids. And here... I, I almost sort of kind of remember getting it. It was a, I think it was a Sunday morning and I had um, a maiden aunt who was really very kind to me at times. And we were at the store 
and she was picking up the Sunday papers, and I must have asked her if I could have it because there's a giant stegosaurus on the cover knocking over a tank. And years and years later, I was able to find it again, and, and my memory, as I was starting to reconstruct my memories, and I said, oh, now I, I remember that book, and, and so I was able to find it years and years later, but I was, and I was fascinated by it. I didn't have the access to the store at the time. I would only go, I, you know, I just, I didn't have money in my pocket or the opportunity, but uh, I would have been buying comics all the time if I could have, but it was only on those periodic trips to what we called then the candy stores when I could find them. But that, that was the first one. And then once, for instance, sites like that Mike's Amazing, which is the greatest site on the internet, where you can just see comic after comic after comic and, and you say, oh, I remember that one now. And it just brings back good memories. So that's how I found, that's how, that was the first one that I read though. Yeah, it's interesting you, you mentioned that about reconstructing your memories of the comics, because we're going to be talking about this quite a bit in a little while. Um, I had very, very vivid memories of the first story that I read, the first comic book I read, but I didn't remember what it was. I knew what this title, what the series it was, but I couldn't remember anything about the issue, the story. I could just remember this one very vivid scene. And it wasn't until many years later when I started collecting Blackhawk. When I was going through the issues, I turned the page and there was the scene. I was like, oh my God, I remember yeah. this like it was yesterday. I just couldn't remember what the context was. You could probably even place yourself in the place where you read it and, you know, remember the moment that you saw it. And I, were I can, and I don't want to spoil anything because we're going to be talking about this issue in That's just a little fine. while. <laughs> uh, it's one of the reasons I was so excited to do Blackhawk because if it wasn't for this series, I wouldn't be reading. I wouldn't have ever started reading or collecting comic books. That's great. That's great. Uh, so other than, say, issues of Blackhawk that you may have reread for Mm -hmm. purposes of this podcast what was the last comic that you read well i can tell you i'm not and i'm not finished it yet i took it out from the library uh, the other day and it's it's a joe kubert uh graphic novel called yosel hmm. Y S S E L, which is uh so far anyways is essentially uh it seems as if it's kubert's autobiography if he had remained in poland with his family during uh world war ii and the holocaust I've heard of it. I heard, I've seen some images from it, but I've never read it. So far, very good. I love Kubert, and, and the more I read Kubert and the more I think about comics, he is just, um, in so many ways, for me, beyond compare. So this is, it's, it's quite a powerful story so far. And he wrote, he, uh, excuse me, drew it. Um, much of it is very, very rough pencils in essentially black and white, and that just adds to the power of it. It really does. It, it makes it uh, almost primal. You know, it's, it's as if he's digging back into these uh, memories that he would have had or that he has heard of from others, experiences that others went through, and uh, really quite good so far. So I'm, I'm, that, that is literally the book that I'm reading right now. Yeah, I, I mean, I think you're right about Kubert. It strikes me that um, he, even though he is considered by a lot of people to be one of the greats, I feel like he still doesn't get the credit he's deserved, in part because superhero genre has been so ascendant in comics, and a lot of, I mean, most of his best work is in other genres. Yes. Um, the stuff, like we talk, there's a great thread on the forums about his uh, Tarzan. Work. I love that thread. And I'm not really a Tarzan fan, I mean, of the character, but right. when you look at the stuff that he was doing in that series, it was just so fantastic, yes. and yet there's not quite as broad an appreciation for his work because he's not, you know, Kirby. He's not, like, creating the Hulk or whatever. Uh, right. I guess I guess you're right. Um, and and of, ironically, of this, they have the same initials. But, yeah, and, and Kirby, you know... Uh, you just, he's just this font of imagination. But Kubert, I th and he may have just matured into it or he was only allowed to do it when he was older. And I think that may be part of it because he was so good. And I'm guessing very, he could be quick too. And he, and he was uh, reliable for deadlines and so forth. And so they could throw anything at him and he could do it. And then he became an editor and you never, you only rarely saw him writing. So that's why some of these books that he's done since, um, and, and for instance, the tour series, he did um, those himself. But uh, And then there was a graphic novel of, of, of tour that came out, of, I don't know how many years ago, but I, I was able to pick that up a few years ago. And you just look at it and you say, wow. And, and some of it he did when he was in his 70s, 80s even, I think. So he's just, uh, to me, he's 
he's just great. Just great. So what is a, a character that you love? Well, I, I think uh, I always, always enjoyed Batman as a kid. And I enjoyed Superman, but it was Batman for me over Superman, I think simply because he could be hurt and he was vulnerable and uh, didn't have superpowers. And I was nuts as a kid about Green Arrow, the old Green Arrow, pre-beard Green Arrow. I liked him after the beard, but I just had a fascination with, um, I, think, I think it grew from my love for Robin Hood, the old Errol Flynn movie. And then I see this character with uh, bows and arrows. And I, it was very easy for me to overlook boxing glove arrows and handcuff arrows because it was just great to see somebody using a bow and arrow. And, um, and I always liked Sergeant Rock. There was something about some of those war comics. The Enemy Ace was another one. I tended to be a DC kid because of distribution as much as anything else. It just wasn't as much Marvel on the stands at first till I was in my teens, I guess. And, uh, and I always, but where Marvel was concerned, I liked uh, Ben Grimm too as well. So there's there's a few that I always had a soft spot in my heart for. Switching to the other side, what characters yeah. do you have a dark spot in your heart for? What's a, who's a character that you hate? I, you know, I thought about this because I knew you were going to ask this, and and I I'd have to say that there weren't too many that I actually hated, but and this speaks perhaps to my generation in my age i can't stand these characters who kill just so indiscriminately um and 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 i have to say i haven't read them much i i know them by reputation as much as anything else um so that this this kind of uh, i don't know this casual attitude toward violence in comics is not one that i i've always uh, that i've ever appreciated and i've always had a kind of a it's just been difficult for me to cozy up to people like that so you know and, and again, I don't want to throw anybody under the bus, so to speak, but, you know, the Punisher, when he first came out, yep, read those stories, found them compelling, but then it seemed to be a one-note um, character who, you know, just solved every problem by, by shooting people. And uh, so that whole trope in comics now and, and that has developed over the years is not one that I'm particularly enamored of. So I don't, so in other words, not a, not a particular one, but uh, that whole idea that casual killing's okay uh, for these protagonists. Just not one I've ever gotten to. I don't think you're alone on that. I uh, feel like... I'm glad, actually, because it seems there's such an emphasis on that. Maybe it's because most of us, you know, on the forums are older collectors, but mm -hmm. uh, this is... When I've been asking people, you know, which characters they hate, names like Wolverine and Deadpool and Punisher yeah. seem to come up pretty much every time. Yeah. And I think, at least in the case of The Punisher, because I can remember when that came out as a magazine and he was first in Spider-Man, there was something there and it was unique and new. And uh, it seems to me, and I, listen, I'll defer to people who've read them much more frequently than I, but I, I, I don't keep up with those. And part of it was just that they just became, it, it just, to me, it just glorified uh, violence. And I'm not, an, I'm not a, an opponent of violence in a comic book. Far from it, but when it's essentially almost like violence porn, I'm not I'm not enamored of it. So we've talked a little bit about this already, but who is a creator that you think is underrated? Well, when I go back, uh, and and I, I thought about this too. You know, sometimes I think a story well told, either in the writing or in the artwork, is undervalued. We we take it. F we don't realize it's being done sometimes because it's done well. And, and uh, so in reading uh, some of the older books that I read when I was younger and that have stayed with me, um, Arnold Drake is a writer. He's coming into his own in terms of reputation now, but he, no one, it seems to me, valued him at the time. And when I was at, um, starting to get into, uh, for instance, Doom Patrol, when I was uh, younger, and uh, even even something like Bob Hope, which was a comic I only saw a few issues of, it was one of these holy grail types of comics where you said, "Wow, look at that!" And they were just they were funny, and they were very much like Mad Magazine, and that was Drake. And same thing with uh, Doom Patrol. It was when when I remember first uh, picking that up, when I was able to finally find that on the stands, it was just so different for DC. It had a a Marvel vibe to it, as everybody always says. But uh, to me, Drake, um, um, I'm glad that he's gotten 
a lot of a lot of credit. And in the same vein, um, there are these other solid artists like, uh, and I'll just throw three out there: Bob Brown, who did Challengers and Tomahawk, did a lot of Batman too. Um, Fred Ray, who did a lot of Western comics and did um, Tomahawk, and also um, George Papp of all people. And I hate the fact that his last name is Pat because people always say, well, that's what he, that, that's what his artwork looked like. And it really wasn't. Um, he did a lot of Superboy. And there was a charming kind of um, unthreatening look to Superboy, which was, I think, perfect for its audience. And, and he told, and as I said, he told the story well. Great face, facial, <coughs> excuse me, expressions. Um, um, and was able to lead you through a story, which to me, as a kid especially, made a big difference so there's there's a couple anyway and what creators do you think are overrated well and it's, it's okay to say grant morrison there's no there's not like yeah, a, i know i you know i heard everybody else saying that and and i and i have to say i haven't read much by him and again you know i'm probably like the uh the old guy living in a cave but uh what i did read of morrison i wasn't too thrilled by i'll tell you what repelled me was um Meltzer's, uh identity crisis that one, again, an example of what I don't care for in comics. It just went nowhere for me. And uh, it was, there was this, I don't know, he's sort of pushing your face into sleaziness, which I didn't really care for. So, and, but again, I haven't read much by him, so he may have written some really good stuff. But if people thought that was good, I would say, no, you're, you're giving it too much credit. You know, there are some others that um, I have to say... Uh, of course, it's a bugaboo for me, and people probably know it from the, the threads. Ernie, Ernie Chan slash Chua. Uh, when people say he was really good, and you know, I think the wonderful Slam Bradley, I think, <laughs> wants to take me out on this, but I just could never. Uh, his, his inking, he was like the Vince Coletta of the 70s and 80s. He just took all the life and, and, uh, and vividness out of, out of guys' pencils. I just uh, never, never liked him. And uh, nothing against the guy. I'm sure he was. He worked hard, and he obviously made made, made his uh, deadlines. But he just never did it for me. Um, so in that sense, and I, and I got to tell you, Neil Adams. He had that run in the '60s and early '70s. But you, after that, to me, a lot of his stuff is unreadable. I looked at some of that. Was it Batman Odyssey that he did? Was that the name of that title? Do you remember that one? I, I don't really follow Batman, but I know. Yeah, he, I don't think Adams has done anything since the '70s that has I been was, worth reading. Yeah, I mean, years ago when when he was, you know, becoming the new thing, you would pick up a magazine he did, a comic he did, just because his name was on it. I, I would avoid it now, <laughs> to be honest with you. So sometimes I think I think sometimes artists um, get into a groove and stay there. And they just don't go go beyond that. You know, Howard Chaikin's another one like that who drives me crazy. It's like, okay, I've seen Dominic Fortune. I've seen it, and now I've seen it again in a new, uh, the same guy in a new outfit. And uh, the first few times it was great, but then it was almost like, okay, let's, could you switch to another horse once in a while, please? That's how I would feel. And like Adams, I feel like Chaikin's artwork has really gone downhill. We're going to be talking about Chaikin some later because he did work on sure. Blackhawk. Exactly. Um, but 10 years ago now, he did an issue of New Avengers during the Civil War. Mm -hmm. And I couldn't believe it was shaken because it was just horrible. It was just so bad. Was it dark and looking kind of dashed off as if it were done in felt tip pen? Because that's always later shaken. Or later shaken, I guess. You know, once he got established, it seemed to me he was just dashing it off pretty quickly. Yeah. And it was just, it just seemed really sketchy and just dashed off like you say as mm. opposed to someone like hubert who oh, was yeah. getting better like he was when he, he was what, 85 or 86 yeah. when he passed away and he was getting better uh, yes yes and and i think you see it in in um you know i know all artists have a kind of a shorthand i guess that they use but you know to me every every shaken guy and every shaken woman looks exactly the same facially whereas hubert and other really fine artists do their best to come up with a different face and, and, and really do expressions well, which I don't see in, in many of the artists. I want to also say I, I'm with you pretty much 100% when it comes to Ernie Chan. There's a oh. whole era of 
covers from the mid to late seventies DC where there's like no background and it's just yeah. like a couple really yeah. ugly figures and they're like some sort of a shade of like green. Yeah. Um, and it's the ugliest uh, era of cover design in the history of comic books. It, there, I, I fully agree. As a matter of fact, later when we talk about Blackhawk, one of the reasons I bought every single issue of that was because the covers, even if some of them weren't great, they were still better than anything DC had been putting out for years. And to me, that was a vast DC wasteland. That whole mid-70s, I don't know when it ended, but early 80s anyway. And uh, there, were just, there was just such bland, vapid artwork especially. So we've just got a couple more questions here. Sure. If, if you were stranded on a desert island, what story or series or run would you bring with you? You know, I'm... <laughs> I think, well, first of all, I might take them in the archives editions only because they're handy and I could find them. But you know what I would like? There's a series that I've, I've always enjoyed, and, and uh, I did find one of the archives um, uh, recently of it. And that's the, the series of stories about Robin in Star Spangled Comics back in the 40s. And if I had my druthers, I'd, I'd take Star Spangled Comics, I think, in, in its entire run because there were so many... and. It, might as well have been all American comics or one of the others. The, those anthology comics, to me, at least make the reading enjoyable. It varies. There are so many different kinds of stories in there. I particularly like the Robin stories in Star Spangled because it, they were like, I don't know, they were they were like 1940s chapters of a 1940s serial where, yes, they weren't particularly weighty, but uh, they were always clever. And Robin was basically always treated with respect, sometimes Batman horned in. But for the most part, as a kid, as a 12-year-old kid reading this, you'd say, "Oh, you know, I can see myself doing that," and uh, and they were just they were just fun, and uh, and of course, Tomahawk was in Star Spangled for a while, and and I've always again had a an unreasoning uh, kind of affection for Tomahawk because I've always loved that period of history, and all of a sudden, when I was a kid and finally saw some of these, I said, "Wow, this is really cool." Daniel Boone, Davy Crockett, Tomahawk, I'm there. So the stories would be different. That's the trouble with reading these, you know, stories in collected archive kinds of editions, as, as people have said all along. Even Enemy Ace, whom I love, and those stories done by Kubert, I love. But you know what? Back to back, 400 pages of them, they were beating the same drum on those too. So it's nice to have a variation. So that's what I'd say. I'll take the, I'll take, I'll take a complete run of Star Spangled comics. The Tomahawk. Maybe uh, in the future, I think we might have even discussed this possibility, but I haven't quite finished putting it together yet. I'm mm -hmm. in the process of putting together as cheaply as possible a complete run of The Son of Tomahawk. Oh, yeah. Um, yeah. It only that was ran for so 11 issues, I think. Yep, yep. And, and there's a lot to like in that. Uh, there's, there's good artwork, and uh, I never cared for Son of Tomahawk's uh, getup. It looked like Elvis. But... Uh, but but the stories and there there again there was Kubert involved. You know they 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 talked about interracial marriage and relationships. There was a, you know a whole um, kind of a subtext of racial uh, stories about racial prejudice in there. So they were decent. They were okay. Yes, and then also the flip side of Ernie Chan that era of DC cover design the the uh, big twenty five cent era mm. from in like 71 72 is yep. by far i think my favorite era of comic cover design from any company yep. i just love those if i if i can come across those cheap like if a dollar yes yeah i'll buy any book from <laughs> from that with that design i don't care what the title is i don't care really what the condition is i just the design's so great i've got a bunch of them that are just like Titles that I never really, I've got issues of Unexpected that I bought sure. just because the cover yeah. design's cool. Yeah, I, that's, I, I love that. Matter of fact, as I said, you know, the Blackhawk, some of these covers, you say, wow, that's that's a good one. That would make me buy this book. And that's, let's face it, that's what they're intended to do. All right, last question. So if you could put together one dream title, any writer, any artist, any characters, doesn't matter whether they're living or dead, whatever, mm -hmm. what would your dream book be? Well, when I thought about this, I said, Kubert's a favorite of mine. I would love him, him on anything. But uh, and the other person, just to vary a little bit, I really grew to like his work. Not grew to like, I was taken aback by it at first because I didn't know anything about him, is uh, Darwin Cook. Uh, 
and what a great loss his death was. And I, I enjoyed so much uh, the stories he did for that uh, New Frontier um, miniseries that DC put out. Again, it was my era. I liked it. And I thought he treated it cleverly and yet um, respectfully. He didn't, he didn't vary so far from the originals that these characters were unrecognizable. And he gave us the kind of depth that was missing in those stories early on. I would love to have seen him do, I'll be honest with you, almost any, any character. So, you know, give me, give me Darwin Cook on, uh, on an anthology of, of different genre. Uh, different genres of, of, of comic stories. I would I would love to have seen that. I think that's a great pick. You know, uh, Darwin Cook, of course, did a lot of um, crime books. Mm-hmm. He did the Richard Parker adaptations, and he worked on Catwoman and stuff. Yeah, so, and the spirit, too, I think, right? Yeah. So when I've thought about this question myself, I haven't quite decided on the writer, but I would love to see a Crime Buster series with Darwin Cook doing the art. There you go. Uh, yep. Like a set in the in the mid fifties, like a yes. crime noir. Um, yeah. I, w- I would have loved that. He, he would be oh. my pick as well. Uh, if I was putting a dream book together, he was good at balancing, you know, what, what is wonderfully silly about comics, but also able to give them the kind of weight and seriousness that, that, that they deserve as well. So good choice. All right. I think we're ready to start talking about Black Hawk now. Uh, for those not familiar with the character Black Hawk, uh, Black Hawk, the character and the concept of the Black Hawk team, which I'll get to in a minute, it was created in 1941. There's some dispute over exactly who should get the credit. Of course, that seems to be the case with most comic book characters. Um, Will Eisner officially has the credit for creating Black Hawk, but he was assisted by other people at his studio, most importantly, Chuck Cadera. And over the decades, Chuck Cadera has basically insisted that he actually did most of the creation of the characters, um, that he was creating the concept before Will Eisner got involved. Um, I read an interview with Eisner about this specifically, and he basically said, it's so long ago, nobody really can say, but as far as he's concerned, he, he was like, eh, does it really matter? You know, doesn't matter who created it. Chuck Cadera was the guy who really made it into an, a viable concept. So if he wants the credit, he can have it. It's fine. <laughs> um, which is both magnanimous and also seemed kind of Stan Lee-ish to me a little bit. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So the basic idea behind uh, Black Hawk is there's a team of uh, international uh, pilots who get together to fight against the Nazi horde. One thing that's interesting about this is that the book actually debuted before America was involved in the war. It was uh, in the middle of 1941, a few months before Pearl Harbor, when the group debuted. So it's like an international team of pilots from kind of all the different countries that had been conquered by Germany with the addition of one or two American pilots, depending on what current continuity you're looking at at the time. Because in some continuity, Black Hawk himself, the leader of the team, is American and in other continuities he's Polish and sometimes he's Polish American. Right. Uh, it's an interesting concept uh, for a couple reasons, I think. Eisner compared it to the Robin Hood myth, like a, a modern version of Robin Hood and his Merry Men, which I think is an interesting comparison and was probably a pretty valid comparison for the time period of the 40s. For modern readers, when you look at it, there's been a lot of these types of groups since Black Hawk was created. Um, it, they really called to mind for me the new X-Men, which was specifically designed with characters from all different countries, like an international group of heroes. And it also, to me, has a lot of echoes um, in like the Seven Samurai. Yes. Where you have, again, a team of people that are banding together and they all sort of have individual personality quirks and specific skills that they bring. And we'll, we'll talk about the, the team right. members in a minute. They all have their own specific niche that they're and in. Seth seems to be the magic number with those groups too. Yes. Yeah. Uh, they, and, I, I think too that um, it always reminded me a little bit of the Foreign Legion as well for the same reason you mentioned. You know, just this, this crew of, of people from different uh, Different countries, different backgrounds blending together. And the Foreign Legion always had a certain romantic uh, aspect to it as well in the movies and in 
in books and so forth. So all of that, I agree. And, and you know, I suppose a little King Arthur in there, too. Yeah, and it's interesting you mentioned the Foreign Legion because Will Eisner mentioned, brought them up as well in an interview. He was talking about the creation of Blackhawk where they were kind of sitting around thinking about the Foreign Legion and about how the members of the Foreign Legion all have like these romantic uh, names that are sometimes mm-hmm. assumed names. Mm-hmm. And so they were trying to come up with the names of the different characters. And it turns out a lot of the members of the Blackhawk team are named for people in Will Eisner's studio who basically uh, slap their own name on the various characters. Like um, okay. Stanislaw is the name of one of the artists has a pen name that he's known by among comics fans, but his real given name was Stanislaw. So he just gave Stan his own name. Oh, that's great. I, di- I wasn't aware of that. That's great. Another thing that's interesting to me about the team is that it's actually not that far fetched in terms of since this was before U S involvement, Mm-hmm. If, if American pilots were going to be involved in the war, they actually would have been involved in this sort of uh, freewheeling, I don't want to say mercenary troop, but sort of an adventurer group where they would have no. had to have yeah. gone to Europe and, and enlisted in one of these groups. There was a lot of that going on, uh, for instance, during the, the Spanish uh, Civil War in the 1930s where there was yep. uh, this group called the Lincoln Brigade, which was all American volunteers. That's right. So... In World War One, of course, the American flyers who went over before we entered the war, the Lafayette Escadrille. And then there were Americans who fought in the, they would enlist in the Canadian Air Force, the Royal Canadian Air Force, and some in the RAF. And the RAF became a gathering point for, as each country was conquered by the Nazis, uh, there, if, if, if military men could escape, they made their way to uh, the British Army. And many, and for, there was a Polish wing of flyers, for instance, in the RAF. So I'm sure they knew about these and you know, were aware of them. Yeah, I think there was a, a clear inspiration um, mm-hmm. that I think modern readers of the comic probably aren't aware of anymore. No. Uh, it seems like a far fetched sort of thing where, oh, we've got this group of elite flyers from all around the world that are bending together, form their own little unit. Um, it's actually not that. Uh, far-fetched at all Not that time so the series was a huge hit and uh, they debuted in mil- uh, military comics number one published by quality comics as I mentioned earlier they eventually got their own title it started with issue 9 it came out in 1944 the first eight issues of the series were published as Uncle Sam quarterly and as they used to do back in the day in order to keep the mail license they kept the numbering um, so they didn't have to spring for a new mailing license so they right. kept the kept the numbering started with issue nine and the series was one of the best-selling comics um uh, how best-selling it actually was is a little hard for me to gauge there are things online where people are, are claiming that it was the best-selling title outside of superman that seems to I be saw, i saw that too and I, I i didn't see any sourcing for it I, I, maybe it was, maybe it was. Maybe it was. I'm a little skeptical because that claim seems to be something that all, like every comic that people want to say is popular. They're all like, well, during the forties, it was the only title that sold better than this was Superman. Superman, right. Yeah. And there was Captain Marvel too, remember? So I don't know how close they came to either of those. But either way, there's, there's no denying that it was very popular. Uh, in 1952, it became popular enough that they actually put out a movie serial right. and this is going to turn out to be important uh, in a strange way for the development of the Black Hawk revival that we're going to be talking about in a couple minutes. Mm-hmm. Um, despite the success though of Black Hawk, Quality Comics, like a lot of publishers, struggled seriously as soon as the Comics Code Authority came into existence at the beginning of 1956. And they pretty quickly decided to close their doors. And in 1957, they sold off all of their characters to DC. Originally, it was a lease deal, but then they decided just to sell them all. DC mothballed most of the characters they bought, but they continued publishing Blackhawk, which I think is kind of uh, proof in a way that the series was selling very well. Yeah. The first DC issue in 1957 was issue number 107. And the book continued along. DC had a, a quite a stable of popular war books at the time, but while many of those continued to be popular through the 60s, the popularity of Blackhawk slowly declined. And here's something, like, I'm curious if you read any of these issues in the 60s of Blackhawk? Yeah, uh, Blackhawk, uh, 
when I was when I was first starting and, and becoming enamored of comics, you know, I'd see ads and I'd see certain magazines or cer certain comics that I, I just never saw them on the newsstands. And uh, Black Hawk was one of those. And I had a cousin uh, who lived in uh, Jersey City because I grew up in New Jersey. And he somehow he got comics I never saw. And one of them was Black Hawk. And he'd always have a few of them around. And he would. And, and, I, and that's where I remember reading my first few uh, issues of Black Hawk back in the you know, mid-60s, like 1964 or something like that. And, uh, and always enjoying it because there was, I, you know, I mean, this is a kid's fantasy. You know, a whole bunch of guys living on an island with access to weapons. <laughs> you know, what could be better, right? And, uh, and they always fought, mon in, in that period, they were fighting monsters and uh, you know, giant turtles and things like that. So, um, and, and it, it, it was, uh, I, I liked it. I never was able to pick them up on my, on my own, though. I rarely saw them until much later. Um, but he always had a few lurking around, so I always read them there. Yeah, it's interesting you mentioned them fighting the giant monsters. We're going to talk about this a little bit later, how Black Hawk served, had kind of an, a specific niche within the line of DC War Books that none of the other titles were really filling i think the closest would be the war that time forgot but that right. was didn't have characters it was just about the concept whereas right. black hawk had the recurring characters um despite the fact that it had this niche though for one reason or another it the slowly lost popularity and in 1967 dc decided to just go completely crazy and turn them all into second-rate superheroes called the junk heap heroes where right. they all got the dumbest superhero identities in the history of comics. Yeah. Uh, there's really no aggregate of superheroes with worse names or uniforms or costumes than this crowd. Yeah, just... <laughs> I mean, if you're, if you're the, you know, Chuck, <laughs> you're the listener, and you're wearing purple pajamas covered with pictures of ears, that, you know, it's not one of those... This will inspire fear in the hearts of my enemies kinds of costumes. No. So needless to say, this did not work out. And with issue 242 in 1968, they decided to revert back to the original concept and it became a much more sort of serious straight ahead war book um, mm -hmm. written by Marv Wolfman in one of his first assignments in comics. And by all accounts... Issues 242 and 243 by Wolfman were really great, but they were. the series and got I, canceled I, before anybody actually got the sales figures back from that. Right, and I, and I almost, uh, I want to say that I think I've read before that Giordano, he was brought over from Charlton, and he got Blackhawk, um, and they said, just end it. And uh, they weren't, no matter what the sales figures were going to be, apparently he wasn't going to be given a chance to run it, you know, uh, and keep it on the on the schedule, and I can remember very well seeing um, Black Hawk two forty two on the stands where the you know it turns out oh well I won't I won't ruin the I should give a spoiler alert I won't ruin the surprise but there is a a villain staring at the Black Hawks as they run from him wearing a kind of a modified Nazi helmet and he had just the creepiest look on his face uh, what you could see of it and uh, the black mask. I think, I think his name was. But the whole point was, all of a sudden, we looked. I looked on the stands. And I said, "Oh my God, this is, this is where they. This is what should be happening." It was the summer of '68, and I can still remember picking that up. And then the next issue came out, cool cover with a crumbling logo, and uh, a great story about a chase across um, several countries, maybe even continents, if I recall correctly, against the Rasputin-like villain. And I said, oh, "This is going to be great." They're, bringing it back. It was art by Pat Boyette, who came over from Charlton, and it was such a shot in the arm, and then pfft, gone, <laughs> naturally. You know, normally I, I would say, since that issue came out almost 50 years ago, it's okay to spoil it, but I actually oh, have sorry. issue 242, and I have not read it yet, so I appreciate oh, you not spoiling that. No, I wouldn't. Oh, I think you'll enjoy it. I'm, I'm hoping you will. I, the only reason I haven't read it is because I wanted to get 243 and read both of them. Yeah, yeah. So that was it for Black Hawk uh, for the next seven and a half years. But at the beginning of 1976, really the end of 1975, but with a cover date of January 1976, mm 
DC brought back Blackhawk. They brought back a whole bunch of titles at the same time here. They brought back Challenges of the Unknown. They brought back Aquaman and several others, all of which were canceled again, with the exception of, of Green Lantern. Um, and But one of them was Blackhawk. And this was a new twist on the series where the characters were brought into the 1970s and they were mercenaries for hire. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And that, that only lasted seven issues. It was canceled with number 250 with a cover date of January 1977. So it lasted one year. And and less horrible than I remember because I dug some of those out to reread them and catch up on those too. George Evans did a lot of the art and he had been an EC uh, artist specializing in airplane stories, you know, fighter pilots and that sort of thing. And he did a nice job for the most part on it. The covers really varied. You know, you're talking about some of the worst covers in history. Um, there were some bad ones on that on that title, unfortunately. But it was it was a noble effort, and uh, but a, a lot of those DC titles just didn't take off that year. And that was very close, if not part of perhaps the uh, famous D- DC implosion. That that was a, that finished up in early '77, and DC you know, Challengers, all those things, just uh, 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 were taken down as part of. The, what was going on at DC. So Blackhawk, I don't know how well it was doing, but you know, it was one of those titles that was eliminated. Yeah, it's, it's interesting. I did not reread these for, for this podcast. I do have that run and I've read them in the past. I don't remember anything about them other than thinking they weren't very good. Mm. They were, you know what, again, to me, the concept was off because the Blackhawks without it's almost like Indiana Jones has to fight Nazis. Otherwise, the stories don't really have the same punch to them. And they need, they need an enemy, and they need to be fighting for freedom and liberty and all these great values rather than just be heroes for hire. And I think that you know, took a little bit out of it. And their, their outfits were... They couldn't decide whether they should bring back their old outfits or keep the red and green ones that they had worn um, beginning in, I think, about 64. And so it was a kind of a merger of those. And, eh. They were all right, but they looked like leisure suits. They were very disco-looking, you know, which is perfect, I guess, for the time. So it's interesting you mentioned Indiana Jones because Indiana Jones plays a key role in the revival of Black Hawk. Uh, yes. In 1981, Steven Spielberg, of course, put out Raiders of the Lost Ark. It was a huge hit. And, you know, as most film fans know, uh, the big inspiration for Raiders of the Lost Ark were the... Uh, serials from the 40s and 50s, the adventure serials. Mm -hmm. And a rumor pretty soon kicked up that Spielberg was thinking about doing a movie about Black Hawk. So we mentioned earlier there was a Black Hawk serial in 1952. Spielberg's a big fan of war movies, as I think we all know. And he's a fan of serials. And so whether or not this was true, I don't know. I've never been... I haven't found anything... like from Spielberg talking about Black Hawk, but it was a widely disseminated rumor at the time that Spielberg was interested in putting out a Black Hawk movie. Yeah, I've heard that too. And uh, and I think DC probably, even if it was only a rumor, wanted to make sure that they had the character in print um, just to be ready. Yep, that's exactly what um, Mark Evanier said. Uh, luckily, Mark Evanier, unlike Steven Spielberg, has talked on the record about... Blackhawk, huh. and I yep. uh, read an interesting interview with him where he talked all about the genesis of the Blackhawk series, and he said it was di- it was directly because of the, the Spielberg rumors. As part of this rumor, um, there was also a rumor that Dan Aykroyd was interested in starring <laughs> as Blackhawk. <laughs> yeah, um, well, which, maybe then he could have pulled it off. Uh, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, big maybe. <laughs> so DC decided to put out a Blackhawk comic to sort of capitalize on this and also just to get things ready in case there was a uh, a movie by Spielberg. And also at this point, they also just needed to put something out to sort of um, uh, re-up their trademarks or whatever because it had been several years since Black Hawk had appeared in the comic. Mm. Now, according to Mark Evanier, DC, but DC didn't really care about Black Hawk. They were just putting it, it was just like a pure like marketing thing. So... Mm-hmm. Evanier says that DC assigned the book to a couple of their old school creators that were under contract where they had to do a certain amount of work or they had to supply a certain amount of work to them. Mm-hmm. And the idea was just, you know what, we're gonna, they're going to put out a quarterly book. They're only going to 
do as much Blackhawk material as they need to fulfill the contract. And they're just going to have these guys do whatever they want because who cares if it sells, it doesn't matter. And Len Wein was assigned to be the editor of Blackhawk, but he was a big Blackhawk fan um, from from back in the day mm. and a friend of Marvel Wolfman's. And basically Len Wein, once he became the editor, he went to DC and he was like, you know, we can't do this to Blackhawk. We can't, you know, it's an important property. There's a lot of fans. It's like a great important comic book thing and the people you've assigned to it suck and they're just going to ruin it. So we're not doing that. We're going to, and we're going to scrap the whole quarterly thing. We're going to put out a real comic with a real creator. And so he immediately went to his creators and chose the team of Marv Wolfman and Dave Cockrum. Now Wolfman, of course, is a big fan of, of Blackhawk having written it before. Dave Cockrum apparently is one of the biggest Blackhawk fans in the world. They actually did a, their own version of Blackhawk for Marvel called Skywolf. That's which right. at that time had not yet been published, but it, they had finished it, um, and it just wasn't published until a couple years later. And uh, so they were like gung ho to do it, but according to Dave Cockrum, they couldn't make it work financially because the page rate for Blackhawk was only two thirds what he was getting paid for other books. Mm. So he just it just couldn't do it from a financial point of view, and they ended up having to pass on the title. So. Len Wein then contacted Mark Evanier, but not to offer him the job of writer, but just to ask him who he thought would be good on the title as an artist. Uh, Mark Evanier suggested that he contact Dan Spiegel, and Wein loved the idea, contacted Spiegel, and Dan Spiegel had worked previously with Mark Evanier on a bunch of books for Gold Key and Dell, like Scooby-Doo, and so Spiegel said, sure, I'll do the book, but I want Mark Evanier to write it. So then Ween had to call Evanier back, mm -hmm. and they, they were basically a team, and so they agreed to do it. And the first issue of the series, number 251, came out with a cover date of October 1982. So I'm just curious, uh, as someone who was reading this at the time, like what your impression was when you saw or heard, however it happened, that they were putting out a new Blackhawk series? Well... I was I was tickled, and um, you know I have to say that in those days, I think the first Blackhawk cost sixty cents, and I was very happy to try to support comics I wanted to give a shot to, you know. And uh, having liked Blackhawk, having been really disappointed when those last two issues of the original run, um, you know, proved to be the death knell for Blackhawk, and. You know, and I, and I bought all the issues of the other one because, again, you know, they weren't that, ex it wasn't so expensive to buy a comic. And, and I figured, yeah, okay, I'm going to support this one and, and see where it goes. And I used to get tired of comics that were only out one, two, three issues, and then suddenly they were pulled. And just, they just never seemed to be able to get their sea legs in, in that short a period of time. So I, I, was, I was glad to see it. And the first cover had uh, Cockrum on it, and he was all that in a tuna sandwich at the time. Rightfully so. And you could tell that they were harkening back to the days of military comics, capital and military comics, because obviously the original costumes were back and they were and it looked like it might have been a Reed Crandall kind of a kind of cover. So yeah, I was I was thrilled. And Ebonier was somebody that I remember at the time knowing about primarily because he had been a, a constant letter writer and um, uh, you know, to both DC and Marvel. So he was a kind of a presence, and he said, "Oh, here's somebody who, you know, there was that. He was probably part of that first wave of fans who made it into the business, and you felt like with him, Len Wein, Marv Wolfman, people like that, Cochran, that these characters would be in good hands, and that they wouldn't just be uh, splayed out and um, and destroyed in front of your eyes by people who didn't know anything about them." So yeah, I was very pleased, and um, and I remember enjoying um, the Spiegel art too. Yeah, I definitely want to talk about Spiegel as we go. I gotta say, I'm not that familiar with him outside of Blackhawk. I know he did a lot of adventure work for Gold Key and Dell, and then he did a lot of like right. cartoon characters like Scooby Doo for for them. Mm -hmm. I've never been a fan of Gold Key and Dell. They're, I, I mean, I, I appreciate on one level the professionalism of the work in their comics, but they also feel kind of impersonal to me. Oh yeah. As a matter so, of fact, 
when when I saw Dan Spiegel's artwork in um, in something like like Blackhawk, where he was more not I don't want to say mainstream, but where he was in one of the big two, so to speak, uh, I, I I liked it, and I said, yeah, I've seen this guy before, you know, reading the occasional Gold Key comic, but they never made a, a point of identifying any of the contributors to uh, to Gold Key comics. So these people were, as you said, kind of anonymous. Plus, you know. A place like Gold Key, they had a very regimented uh, approach. All the layouts looked exactly the same. There was a real blandness in, about most of their comics most of the time. So, um, and I and he probably had a chance here with, especially with layouts, to have some some fun that he couldn't have really at Gold Key. Yeah, and we're going to talk about that fun and the fun that Mark Evanier had reviving Blackhawk in our next episode, starting with issue two fifty one. That's it for this time. I hope you enjoyed listening to this episode of the Classic Comics Forum podcast. I hope you'll join us next time that we do an episode of the podcast for more deep dives into some of the great and sometimes not so great comics of the past. Uh, Let me know what you think in the comments down below, and I'll see you next time.